Philippians 3, verse 12. Would you stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God? The Bible says, not that I have already obtained or am already perfected or matured, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Isn't that a great word? Jesus laid hold of me. So there's really nothing for me to lay hold of until he lay hold of me. We're not talking about a decision there. We're talking about a disciple, someone that Jesus got hold of. They'll never be the same. They become a follower infinitely now that they know him. And here's the greatest missionary spokesman that ever lived apart from Jesus himself and listen to this humble statement. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Here's a key word, still room for further development. Here is the great missionary statesman saying, I'm still growing. I've not arrived. There's still some things for God to do in my life. No wonder he would say in the last chapter of his life, I fought a good fight. Stay with me. I kept the faith. I kept the faith. And when you have the faith, you'll be so overwhelmed, you'll keep it. And he finished the purpose for which he was here. He finished his race. And so I've not apprehended, but one thing I do, before we talk about focus and intentionality, forgetting those things which are behind us and reaching forth to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God speak deliberately. For Christ's sake, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Paul is here picturing a race. He constantly used athletes, the athletic pitcher, in driving home his points. In verse number 12, it's as though he's getting our attention on the start. Then verse number 13, it's like we're on the course. And then verse 14 is the end. To just stay thematic for just a moment over the last few weeks, let me pose this question. What if you claim there's a start, <laughs> but we never see you on the course? Are you really in the race? And how under heaven can you finish if you only claim there's a start, but you never run? And so there is a progression in the life, the journey of the Christian. So Paul uses this analogy to describe the runner and it's a picture of the Christian spiritual growth. Uh, Simon Peter being a fisherman, a rough customer, but came to Christ. It's amazing that he would pen, the last words we have that he ever penned were these words, but grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. So the believer has not reached his goal of Christ's likeness. None of us can stand up and say, hey, just like to give testimony this Sunday morning, I'm there. No, many of us could say we've started and we could say where we feel we are on the journey and I'm gonna try to help us to identify where we are. But like the runner in the race, you've gotta to continue to pursue it because the ultimate goal is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Paul, it seems as though he's telling us that he desires to reach, here it is, his own personal God-given potential. His own personal God-given potential. Whether you're a middle schooler, a senior, college student, anywhere in the adult family, at times we should be asking, what does God have here for me? Uh, what does God wish to do with my life? One of the greatest sins in the life of a person that already knows Christ is moving from being Christ-dependent to self-reliant. And self-reliant really leaves Jesus out of the equation when you think about your future. I'm going to do this. I won't do that. Have you, <laughs> have you prayed about it? I mean, now that there's a commander-in-chief, that is leading and directing your life. So maybe deep within your heart, there's a desire to really amount to something in his kingdom. Knowing that this culture has made its mark on the church, 
It's beyond time for the church to make its mark on the culture. So I want you to listen to these words. I want to introduce this theme with these words. In Paul's life, let's just use him as a, a great, wonderful example. And by the way, all of us have encouragers and people we look to that are a little beyond us and we can learn from their life. So here's a man with a desire, a desire to achieve life's purpose where when he comes to the end of the journey, he can feel that he fought a good fight, that he kept the faith, and that he finished what God placed him here for. So that's real intentionality. I want to lay hold of. I want to make my own possession. And then there's a decision to achieve life's purpose. It's a humble decision that I'm not there yet. It's a hopeful decision, but this one thing I do, I want to do something for it to happen. He, he speaks of his capacity, uh, not that I've already obtained. I, I've always loved this one-liner from Charles Spurgeon when he said that man has misjudged his capacity for God. There's so much more God could do with us. That sort of drives me. And he said, I'm not already there yet, but I want to get there. There's room for development, but I'm going to press on. And then he talks about, you got to be careful, and this is where many of you and others that will hear this message are, and that is there's distractions in achieving life's purposes. And normally it's something that you've done in the past. Wonder what Paul was referring to when he said, forgetting those things which are behind. And by the way, let me give you a warning when you're reading your Bible. Quit trying to deify anybody in the Bible other than Jesus. It's amazing if you, Paul says he had a struggle, somebody says, that's before he became a Christian. What are you doing? You're trying to deify him as though he never had any problems. No, he was being vulnerable and sharing with you that even though we would consider him 21 centuries later as being a wonderful man of God, he had challenges. He had clay feet also. Only one had feet of bronze. So he said, forgetting those things. And we could try to speculate on other texts, but you don't know, neither do I, all that he was trying to forget. But here's what he was trying to do. He was trying to say there's a reason that the windshield is broader than the rearview mirror. That's a good word. <laughs> and so you can spend your time looking back, or you can get your eyes forward and say, by the grace of God, I will no longer allow this to influence me from reaching my God-given potential. There's a determination to achieve life's purposes of reaching forth to those things which are ahead. And, and here's the cool thing, because this is what people are without. People lack direction. People love it when a preacher says he's going to preach on how to know the will of God. Because what you're saying is, if I embrace this for my life, where does it end up? And so he talked about the destination. So listen to this. In order to be faithful on a journey, you've got to love where it's, it's going to take you. You've got to love where you end up. And so I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I've read the end of the book, and I know where the finish line is. So let me tell you what he's talking about here. It's not even up for debate. He's talking about that his ultimate goal in life is that when it's all said and done, there would be greater Christ-likeness in his life. That's what he's going for, Christ-likeness. The prize is to be like Jesus. So if we've received Christ as Lord and Savior, and by the way, it's not over when you receive him. That's where it all starts. So you've received him as Lord and Savior. So I can actually, you may not be able to, my wife would tell you that as a teenage girl at Myrtle Grove Presbyterian Church while Presbyterian evangelist Mickey Rice was preaching, her grandmother taking her to church, she was soundly converted to Jesus. It was through the influence of a godly grandmother, Selma Allen, that influenced my gorgeous wife. I would tell you that I was 20 years old, was managing a pool room, and it was a snowy Sunday night, and I'd never been to Sunday night service, but I went because I got under deep conviction on Sunday morning, and I sensed that there was something missing in my life. Somehow or another, instead of me comparing myself with other people, God kind of showed me a picture of how holy Jesus is, and I realized how much I checked up, and that night I went back and I repented of my sins, placed my faith without reservation in Jesus Christ, and I've not been the same. I'm telling you, I've been on this journey for 41 years, and it all goes back. That's where it started.
but it for sure didn't end there. So, boy, do that. So, can, would you do a little mental road trip with me right now? You may not remember the date just like Miss Janet, but would you do this? Would you go back right now? Because we're going to go on a journey over these next few weeks. Get in your mind's eye. Let's go ahead and, and while you're there, fast forward that one day you're going to going to leave. Um, this is a nice place, but nobody can stay. It's not like Hotel California. You will check out. For you younger ones, your parents will explain that when you get home. You will check out. And when you do check out, based on whether you check into heaven or hell, it's predicated on whether you ever repented of your sins and put your faith solely in Jesus Christ for your rescue from your sins and condemnation, the gospel. So there's more to the relationship than just extracting eternal life. Oh, finally I'm saved, now I can go back to living my life. No, once you're saved, he infuses you with his life <laughs> and it so overrules. But now your life finds its greatest joy and fulfillment in letting him have his way in your heart and life. So if we're willing to cooperate over these next few weeks with him, he still wants to fulfill his dream for your life. Some of you are probably about hoping, thinking, oh, you really think he has a purpose and a dream and potential for my, my life? Absolutely. So his dream includes a compelling life purpose a continual source of joy and peace, an intimate relationship with Christ, a mind filled with timeless wisdom that only God can give, a heart overflowing with love for him and for others. And this list is not exhaustive. So truth is, since we came to Christ and this spiritual transformation, this change started, you've experienced a portion, and so have I, probably just a small portion of the reconstruction and the transformation he has in mind. But sadly, few American evangelical Christians experience the totality he has to offer for them. Few of us make the commitment and are diligent to his desire to make us people of character, decision-making, values, and lifestyles that are reminiscent of Jesus. Jesus. 